Hello and welcome to the programme. Rescuers in Turkey and Syria are increasingly now focusing their efforts on the survivors of Monday's earthquakes who are enduring the aftermath in the cold winter there, of course. Uh, more than 24,000 people are now known to have died. Uh, we can take you to these live pictures of the rescue efforts, but as we know, of course, uh, the chances of finding people alive uh, diminish as every hour goes by, and thoughts now to the hundreds of thousands of people who need to uh, survive and rebuild, given uh, what has happened there. Uh, we know the uh, United Ni Nations will play a crucial role. The humanitarian chief, the person in charge, has arrived in the region. We'll be uh, bringing you what they say in just a moment, and we will be bringing you pictures of some remarkable uh, rescues. First, though, I want to concentrate on the difference between the rescue efforts in Turkey and in Syria. We have a correspondent, uh, Quentin Summerfield, who is on the Syrian side of the border. And listen to what he says about the difference in the rescue efforts there. This is the town of Harem in northwest Syria. There's a bit of activity here, but nothing like you see the, uh, in terms of activity on the other side, on the Turkish, uh, the Turkish side of the border. The border is literally just across that hill. Uh, the people here have lost about 700 buildings, another 4,000 or so are unsafe. So they're living in tents. If I can just swing around here, you per can perhaps see the, the internally displaced people's camp that has been set up over there. Um, they're also telling us that in terms of foreign aid, they've received next to nothing. Uh, some Spanish doctors made it to some of their hospitals, but nothing else. The contrast here with what's going on in Turkey is astonishing. Uh, over on that side of the border, there's a constant sound of sirens, of heavy machinery, of people working. Well, there's none of that here. Down there, there are small children removing the rubble, while the international community isn't here it's been left to small boys to remove the rubble from these broken buildings and, and, and to try and find bodies. And, and it is bodies they're trying to find now because they say that the time for looking for, for survivors has passed here, that that passed 24 hours ago. There are, this is mainly a recovery mission. There are, they're no longer rescuing people. And the reason they're no longer rescuing people is because the aid just didn't come quick enough. That was Quentin Somerville there, drawing a stark contrast between those uh, rescue and recovery efforts in Syria and in uh, across the border, just a couple of miles away in Turkey. Interestingly, our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, described earlier on the situation in Syria as a crisis within a crisis, which is, again, a pretty stark way of uh, describing it. Now, Lise Doucette has been in Turkey now and has been speaking to the UN humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, who has just arrived in the area. Let's listen uh, to what he had to say. Martin Griffiths, you have seen so many disasters in so many parts of the world. How does this compare? I think it's the worst natural disaster that I've ever seen. And it's also the most extraordinary, extraordinary international response, as you know. We have more than 100 countries who've sent people here. So there's been an incredible response. But there's a need for it, as we see behind us. And what is so amazing is that people are still, as you know, Luke's, coming out of the rubble alive six days in. So it's shocking. It's also, in the perverse sense, quite heartening. Heartening in what way? Well, the response. The response. The fact that the people with great expertise who got here very quickly, committed, working day and night to do what's needed, that's remarkable. And I hope that when we launch our appeals for both Turkey and Syria the next day or so, that we'll get the generous donor response as well. What do they need the most now? What they need the most now is to, to come to a conclusion as to when they call off the rescue efforts, which is a really difficult question because of who is left behind. And then I think as Ted Ross of WHO has said, really worried about medical next, but particularly in northwest Syria where we have cholera already. But medical facilities here are, are obviously overwhelmed, as you know. Um, so there's a huge need for urgent medical care, mobile clinics, field hospitals. I think the United Kingdom is sending in a field hospital, for example. And then the period of humanitarian aid, the next three months, for which we're appealing, which will cover 
shelter, uh, livelihoods, food, nutrition, and, 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 and healthcare. And, and so to give people a sense, those people who've had to leave their homes, that there is a stable future awaiting them even in this awful time. Do you think there is a stable future awaiting them? You know how hard it is well, to raise money in a world where there's one disaster after another. I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, it's going to be very difficult because there's a lot of needs on both sides. And I think as President Erdogan has said, it's going to take a year to rebuild uh, some of the houses. That's I optimistic. That's, that I think it's optimistic. And, and in, in Syria, it's going to be much more difficult. The tragedy about Syria is that it was bad enough in the northwest, as you know. In the last rebel held area, in the last Syria. Rebel her, uh, area, before all this, and then all this came. Uh, I think we can raise consciousness and money just as we have seen the response here. We'll see. We'll see how those appeals go. But at least the agencies that we're working with, the international agencies and NGOs and national NGOs, we all know each other well. We've been working together a long, many years in this region. That's an advantage. There's been a lot of criticism of the United Nations across the border in Syria, particularly in Idlib. They're saying you're letting politics get in the way of humanitarian relief because you're not there on the ground. Well, we're not there on the ground, as you know, because the Security Council uh, has only allowed a cross-border resolution this many years, which provides for uh, UN aid to go through a single crossing and to be delivered to, to national organizations there. This is not new. This is eight years old. This is not about... But why does that have to be either? People are asking, why do you have to go through the UN Security Council? Why should the humanitarian needs be hostage to the gridlock of the Security Council, where Russia well, and China veto well, the UN's I, pleas? Well, you know, that, that's a long story. It's to do with the Syrian government's uh, claims for sovereignty. But I, I want to say this on, on that issue. I don't think it's right to give up hope that we will get access. We are looking very, very actively and firmly and hard for opening up two more crossing points. We're going to through put, Turkey into... Yeah, through Turkey into the northwest in the coming days. We're going to put a resolution where we go before the Security Council. If anybody wants to veto it, let them do so. The case for those two additional crossing points is a black and white humanitarian case. This is not politics, please. And people who say that we're playing with politics, that's not fair.